the older I get, the faster time flies. Uh, 22 years ago, we launched Michigan Golf Live, and I thought that was forever ago. And then I, I realized that 25 years ago was an epic confrontation in the United States Amateur Championship featuring our guest here, Steve Scott, and uh, a guy by the name of Tiger Woods, who went on to do fairly well. And uh, Steve, here we are catching up a quarter of a century later because you've kind of taken that experience and tried to kind of turn it into a life lesson for a lot of people and to look back at how the, uh, some key moments in that tournament got, in many ways changed golf history, which is pretty powerful stuff. How are you doing? It really did. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Bill. Uh, so 25 years ago, how, how vivid are the memories all, a quarter century later? Uh, still very vivid. It's it was amazing going through and uh, the process of writing this book and going through the you know kind of the mental gymnastics of going back in time and uh, you know finding all the remembering all those thoughts that I had you know in between holes or after I hit a shot or uh, so the the memories are certainly very vivid and they always they really always have been. I mean it was a day for me that it was just truly burned into my brain. I mean, it was, uh, is one of those, one of those days that, uh, you know, obviously tiger created history of his own, uh, by winning three straight U S amateurs. But for me, uh, there was a lot of great things that happened in that match that really were, uh, extremely positive and I've carried with me for the last 25 years and I'll carry with me forever. Yeah. Um, before we go any further in the conversation, let me tell everybody the, the, the name of your book, which is coming out June 1, but you can pre-order now, is, hey, Tiger, you need to move your mark back. <laughs> Nine simple words that change the game of golf forever. Uh, Steve, there's one thing I know about golfers. We have ridiculously precise memories when it comes to experiences on the golf course. We may not remember our anniversaries or what we had for dinner two days ago, but we can go back a bunch of years, even in casual rounds with friends, if something outstanding happened one way or the other. So I'm not shocked that you have recall because this was the national audience. Everybody was watching every shot because we had just begun hearing about this kid named Tiger. Meanwhile, this kid named Steve kind of flying under the radar was about to take down Goliath. So what, what was your game like those days? And, and what did you think when you first saw the brackets leading you towards this confrontation? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing, right? I mean, you think about making it to the finals of the U.S. Amateur and the, you know, any event, I mean, 312 players start the U.S. Amateur. And so, and then 64, only exactly 64 make it to match play. And, you know, if in theory, I shouldn't even have been in the match play. Uh, I shot 79 the first day of stroke play and had to shoot 66 the second day just to make the cut. And um, yeah, exactly. And it was kind of, you know, uh, that was pretty fortunate. And then from that point on, I, I was just, I, hold, I was holding every putt and seemed like every match I did something great that um, you kind of don't do playing golf every day. And every match I had a great long putt or I hit a, you know, hit a shot, I hit chipped in from off the green or just did something that was kind of, uh, you know, I had like a, a lot of once in a lifetime shots every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if, if you're playing well, you, you tend to get some breaks along the way. And I think if you're not playing well, those breaks, everything seems to lip out or kick the wrong way and all. So if you get into a hot streak like that and you find that you're, you're moving on through. I mean, you go 79, 66, that's pretty crazy. So there's something special happening if you have that 66 in you. And at Pumpkin, Pumpkin Ridge, uh, we're dealing with a golf course that's got a fair amount of challenge to it. Mm -hmm. um, when in that tournament did you start thinking to yourself, I, I, got, a, I got a shot at this? You know, I just kept getting good breaks and I, I was holding a lot of putts and I just love match play too. I think the, the fact that match play always allowed me to play and still does to this day when I compete, but match play allowed me to play so freely because if you lose a hole, it's, it's that you just lose one hole. I mean, you could make an eight and your opponent makes a three 
And you, instead of losing five strokes in a stroke play event, you lose one hole. And so there's a lot more freedom to, to play aggressively in match play. And um, I don't know, I just, I used that freedom to my advantage and just things just kind of worked out and, and I advanced through and yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that, uh, you know, to, to face, uh, you know, to, to be on opposite sides of the bracket and you think of the probabilities of, of facing a guy like Tiger Woods in the finals. And um, yeah, it's just, it's pretty mind blowing everything that, that goes into getting to that day uh, at, in the finals. Yeah. We of course know now what the impact and the legacy of Tiger Woods is on the game. But then what was the buzz about this kid, this skinny kid from California that um, had a lot of hype, but it was so early, nobody really knew if he'd deliver on it. Were you aware of him? Was there conversation about him? I, I know he was quite a bit longer than most everybody else, but other than that, what, what was the buzz? Well, certainly there was a big buzz on, you know, whether he would turn pro after the event. And uh, he was obviously going for three straight U.S. amateurs with which Jack Nicholas and Bobby Jones and Arnold Palm. Nobody's ever won three U.S. amateurs in a row. And, and um, yeah, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty remarkable what he was about to do. And but, yeah, the media was was on him all the time and asking him about that and and asking him about uh you know, just, you know, whether he can, you know, the, the big speculation was Nike was courting him and it just happened to be, uh, you know, a few miles down the road from <laughs> Nike headquarters out there in Portland, Oregon. And Phil Knight was inside the ropes every day and watching every match. And he and Butch Harmon would talk after each match. And, and, um, and yeah, Phil, uh, to me, he, he told me that, that every, Every hour that he spent with Butch, every time he spent uh, with Butch after each match, up Tiger's contract by a million each time. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, there are amateurs and then there are wink, wink amateurs. And Tiger, of course, was literally waiting to put his name on a piece of paper that had already been drawn up with some numbers on it that at the time were unheard of, unfathomable. Meanwhile, what was your plan for the game? Were you hoping mm -hmm. at some point? to turn professional or were you in it for the amateur love of the game? Well, for me, I, I think you have to look back and, th you know, I was only going into my sophomore year at the university of Florida. So I, I wasn't, there was no consideration of turning pro at that point. Um, uh, and really to that point, if you think about it in golf history, nobody, not nobody, but almost everybody had good. They'd complete their college degree or at least complete their eligibility you know, from Phil Mickelson to Justin Leonard. Um, I mean, I know Jack Nicholas didn't. He went three years of college. But um, a lot of the players really, you know, they didn't leave college early. And so Tiger, Tiger set a lot of precedents during his career. But one of those precedents was leaving college early. And a lot of people have followed suit since that point. And so, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's just remarkable what he did in such a short amount of time. And those six USGA championships in a row and, and everything that's surrounded it, how he could block everything out and still play so great. Yeah. And um, between the two of you, now let's move to the championship match between the mm -hmm. two of you uh, first tee or maybe throughout the match. Is there much conversation uh, in his professional pursuit of greatness it's pretty widely known that Tiger's not going to be carrying on a lot of conversations with his <laughs> opponents. Maybe, maybe in the last couple of years, he, he loosened up a little bit, but certainly right. that was not the case for the vast majority of his career. How about at the 96 USM? No, no, there was, <laughs> there wasn't much talk then either. It was, you know, uh, basically I said, good shot. And he said, thanks. And that was <laughs> it. I mean, that was literally, that was literally it, right? You laugh, but that was the truth. Right. And so, you know, certainly there was a lot of pressure that day that we weren't going to be carrying on a lot of conversation. I mean, it was, it was, it was a battle. It was a, certainly a battle. And um, yeah, I, I, cert I know I gave him more than he thought that I was going to give him that day. Yeah. Um, you were taking him down. You, you were about to slay Goliath. Again, Steve Scott's book is called, Hey Tiger, you need to move your mark back. It's nine simple words that changed the game of golf forever. And here it is a quarter of a century later, 
And uh, let me have you dial us in to what's happening in the match at this point. You're, you're coming down the home stretch. You've got a you've got a pretty good lead on him, and I'll let you take the story from here. Right. So I was five up after 18 holes, kind of backpedaling a little bit, and I shot the equivalent of two under par in the second 18, and did not win. Wow. On a very tough USGA setup, firm, fast greens, long, thick, rough. Uh, hang on just a second. I, I want everybody to just take a <laughs> quick moment, and I want you to hear what Steve just said. Now, it's a 36-hole final in the, in the yep. uh, USAM. So after 18 holes, he's five up. And everybody's probably thinking, Steve, without really paying attention to the details, <laughs> oh, the poor guy choked. You know, the poor guy went out there and shot a 93. And of course, <laughs> you know, he did a Greg Norman at Augusta. And of course he lost. Yeah. You were two under in the second 18 holes with a five hole lead. All right. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. I want to make sure people understand you were playing really well. I was playing really well. I mean, I guess if it was stroke play that day, I would have won, but I guess that's kind of like the, uh, you know, the popular vote versus the electoral college, right, <laughs> in politics. But, um, you know, it, it was, um, yeah, he, he played some unbelievable golf in that second 18 and uh, whittled into my lead pretty quickly in the, in the opening 18. Uh, I hit a lot of good shots. I, I missed a couple, a couple putts inside of six feet that I wish I would have had back kind of in that front nine of the second 18. And then we had a, a kind of a punch counter punch moment um well really there was three holes in a row that were pretty epic he won the the 27th hole the ninth hole in the afternoon I hit a flop shot in uh because he makes birdie on that hole I hit a flop shot in for birdie on the the par three tenth which was the 28th and then he comes right back on the 29th hole and holes about a 40 footer with five feet of break in it uh for eagle and I'm up there about three feet for birdie I mean I'm gonna make birdie and he's got a putt that he could three putt more than half the time and he decides to make it so we go back and forth there in the middle part of that second 18 and you know we were you know jockeying for position and you know kind of like a, a great horse race coming down the stretch and and so we get to the 34th hole of the match the 16th hole and and I'm two up with three to play I had just won a couple holes prior to go two up and so we both drive it. I had the honor off the tee and I drove it down there, hit a great drive, probably 285 off the tee. And he drives it down. Uh, he was he was crushing it past me. He hit driver as well. And he hit it 53 yards past me on that hole. And I hit my Sunday best, mind you, with adrenaline. And I hit it really well. And um, and so we get up there. I have six iron to the green. He has sand wedge. So I'm like 173 wow. or something, and he's got inside of 120. He's got 117 or 118. So um, I my lie, I didn't draw a great lie. Uh, it was kind of in like an old divot on a, a little bit of a down slope, and I I hit this push cut uh, into the fair, into the greenside bunker. He hits his sand wedge up there. One hops into the into the first cutter rough, spins back down the hill about six feet from the hole. So I'm thinking, okay, he's going to make birdie here. He's, he's got to do something. I mean, if he doesn't do something right now, it's over and I win this match. And, and so I get up there and I hit my bunker shot out. It didn't have a great lie. I couldn't put a lot of spin on it. And I hit it about 10 feet past the hole. So I get up there and I'm looking at the break of my putt. It's breaking, you know, it's just outside left, maybe a, a half a cup or a cup outside the left, breaking to the right. And his ball marker is smack in my line. And, you know, kind of like you would when you're playing with the boys on a Saturday morning, you say, hey, hey, slide that one over one. And and so he did. And I went up there and 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 mind you, nothing else about from what I'm about to say would matter unless I make my par putt. Because if I make if I don't make my par putt, I'm going to concede. He's going to two putt from six feet. I'm going to concede the hole and, you know, we're going to move on. And so I get up there. I hit a pure putt. I hit this thing dead center. It was a great putt under, under the pressure of, you know, the weight of the world basically on me. And, um, and I'm walking off to the side of the green and I kind of look out of the corner of my eye and not, not very much time had passed between when I picked my ball out of the hole and when he put his ball down on the green. And I said, 
hey, did you, did you move that bat? You need to move that bat. And he had to stand up and put his mark down, go through his whole process of remarking the ball and putting it back. And, and um, you know, I, I guess if you know your match play rules, if you play from the wrong spot, you automatically lose the hole. And given the status of that match at the time, I would have won the match three and two. And, um, you know, it, it was a moment where certainly um, the greatness of the game was, was, was put on full display, right? It's not, Hey, Steve Scott is this great guy. I was basically at that point being a steward of the game, right? I was being a, um, you know, just a, it's kind of what you should do in the game. This is why golf is on this pedestal. This is why everybody watches and listening, listens to Michigan golf live. This is why we all play golf all around the world because golf is this separating sport from all these other sports where you try to get away with as much as you can. Whereas golf, we police ourselves and we, we are our own, you know, judge, jury, and executioner essentially out there. And so we, we have to have uh, golfers, true golfers, I think have a, have a conscience that maybe people in other sports don't have. Yes. And did Tiger acknowledge the, uniqueness of what you did there because you could have you could have done it as he was walking off the green say by the way did you did you put the marker back and at that point he loses the hole in the match so was there any acknowledgement of that uh about 20 years later yeah <laughs> that's a little more delayed gratification than i would have expected um yeah so yeah i mean you know what you know tiger tiger i i don't mean to cut you off but tiger has done so many great things in the game um, he's, he is the greatest golfer of our current generation. I, I sure hope he can get out there and play competitive golf again. You know, if he doesn't certainly live, hopefully live a, a, a fruitful life for his kids being with what he has gone through with all of, all of his, uh, you know, uh, everything that's going on in his life. And especially recently with, uh, all his major injuries, but Tiger, and these are a couple of digs I take in the, in the book at him, but, um, you know, Tiger did not acknowledge the fact that, that I helped him. And, um, you know, I, I just don't think he was wired that way. Uh, you know, you have to, you have to kind of go back to the parenting and this is what, you know, I have kids and, and parenting is very, very important in life. And if you don't learn certain things of how to acknowledge your opponent when, when they help you, um, yeah, it was kind of a, it kind of left a sour taste in my mouth, honestly, but, but overall, look, I mean, it was, it, it's in a moment like that, when so much is going on, I guess it could be easy to, to forget some of the, the niceties of the game. And so, um, yeah, it was just, it was just an epic match. That was, it was gut wrenching for me. It was obviously historic for him, uh, but it was, it was a great moment for the game of golf. And I think that that's, you know, and, and you know, what would have happened? I mean, I know you've mentioned the title of my book a few times, but, and, and I'm not saying that if I didn't remind him to move that back, the, the world would be totally different than the world of golf. I mean, look, Tiger probably would have still gone on and won a lot of events and a ton of majors, but he is human. And we've saw this after he, he lost to Y.E. Yang at the PGA championship in 2009 that, you know, it, it, he, he did shake his confidence a little bit. And so, you know, would he have gone on to turn professional right then and there had he lost that match on what arguably is a kind of a bonehead mistake that maybe that the greatest player of all time should not have made? Um, would he have gone and win the Masters eight months later? Um, you know, would he have gone on and done so many things right away? Who knows? That's, that's kind of the question in the book. And the other question of the book really is uh, everybody who reads it, you know, would you have done the same thing? Right. Would you as a golfer and as a person reminded him in that moment and remembered to do something like that? And um, that's kind of the, that's the introspective look that the book offers every reader. Yeah. And um, it's entirely possible that, that people in that position may very well have had great intentions, but were so wrapped up in the nervousness and the intensity of the competition that they just literally wouldn't have thought of it. It, it wouldn't necessarily have been a intentional slight or I'm gonna, I'm gonna bust him on this one on the walk to the next hole. You just, I mean, you got a few other things on your mind at that point. So it could be a number of different things. The, 
to me, the, the interesting byproduct of all of this, we, we know where Tiger went from there, but I'm curious in the Steve Scott world, I don't know how long it took you to uh, sort of, I don't, uh, recover is not the right word because you didn't choke this thing away. He just, he turned it on and he had that gear. But how long did it take you before your, your insides stopped hurting? Because that had to really gut you. Yeah, it, it, it did. I, I think it would have gutted me more for maybe a couple if if it if it uh, unfolded a few different other ways. I mean, um, you know, had I totally blown that second 18 and, you know, shot three over five over, you know, 75, 78, which could have happened. Um, I didn't. Um, so, you know, if I did, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. I probably wouldn't have written a book about it. Um, certainly if, if, if that moment doesn't happen on the 34th hole, right. Um, you know, I, if, if I would have forgotten, let's say I forgot, which could have happened. Um, if I would have forgotten, I mean, I would have always kind of wondered, you know, you know, I, I would have won the U S amateur at that point, but you know, would, uh, would, uh, you know, would my, you know, would my uh, mentality be the same? And would I, would I always look back and kind of like with an asterisk, like, you know, or would history have a, an asterisk on it? Like Steve Scott won, Tiger probably would have won or come back, <laughs> but things happened in that match the way they were supposed to happen. And I, I could sleep really well at night, every night since then, honestly, knowing that, I, I left everything out at Pumpkin Ridge that day. I left, you know, I played the greatest game I could under the most extreme pressure. And I, I upheld the game of golf that has been so great to me over my whole life that it, it happened the absolute perfect way, to be honest with you. Uh, 1996, we don't have DVRs. We don't have iPhones. We don't have a whole lot of things. Is there somewhere in the Steve Scott household a VHS tape of this tournament? Or do you have... <laughs> Do you have any desire to watch it? Well, I've watched it a lot, actually. Um, you know, sometimes I turn it off before that 38th hole, but, <laughs> but um, you know, it's uh, it, with the magic of, of the USGA app and YouTube and all that uh, it's, it will live, it will live forever. Yeah. Um, and I hope it does. And this is, and this is part of the reason I wrote the book because I want this moment. I want all the future generations of the game to understand that this is how we play golf, right? I mean, I, I guess when I watch, um, and not to call somebody out, but we will because we, we, we see him, a guy named Patrick Reed. I know this, this name is probably on your brain right now, mm -hmm. but we, you know, I, I'm picturing, uh, you know, a, a 10 year old watching the, you know, a Patrick Reed and, or somebody in another sport that's, you know, that's trying to get away with things and trying to, in the effort to win, right? And I'm picturing that, that young, young person watching this and thinking, hey, I can do that too. I can, if I, you know, I can fudge the rules because he did it and he got away with it. And so I want people to know and understand and always remember this moment in golf history that, that definitely could have, you know, made Tiger Woods's career very different, at least for the immediate future following it. Um, and, and just because now we look back on Tiger's career and we know him as this killer that will just, you know, go out there and crush people, but things could have been, they could have been very different yeah. at a very key, key moment in his last amateur match that he ever played. So um, I want everybody to remember that. I think that's the, and remember the greatness of the game and understand that, that this is how you're supposed to play the game and that that taking home the trophy at the end of the day is not, you know, it doesn't always measure success in one's life. You mentioned that it, that it took 20 years for Tiger to acknowledge your active sportsmanship. So that would be just five years ago. What was that context? What, why did it happen? Where did it happen? And were you at least there when it, when it happened? Did he call you or text you or what? No, never, never told me directly. It was, um, there's a really nice 12 minute mini documentary that's, uh, that's on out on YouTube and out, uh, golf, golf films. I think it was golf magazine was behind it and they put together a really nice, this 12 minute mini documentary of the match, um, you know, and, and kind of 
how you know where where I ended up with, as a PGA professional now, um, and still I still compete in the game and all that. But yeah, it, it was uh, that that was really the uh, and Tiger sat down for an interview there. We weren't we weren't sitting at the same time, but um, yeah, it, it, he he acknowledged it that he he forgot, and which it's kind of it put it a little closure at least it put a little closure on the moment at least for me to understand that that I actually did, I did help him in that moment because I didn't know for 20 years. And that was, it was kind of one of those things that was just kind of hanging out there in the world. And it, it was kind of nice to know that, that he finally acknowledged it. It's kind of funny. Um, all of us are different, uh, especially us guys, as we get a little bit older, we can sometimes soften and, and develop a bigger life perspective to understand that sometimes we just did things wrong. And, and there's a way to recalculate and reset and maybe start doing some things differently. And then there's that other side of the coin where a lot of guys get further entrenched in, in whatever uh, their behaviors were as a younger person. Uh, you know, I hear you say that. And I'm like, geez, Tiger, get out a note card and send the guy a note or something like that. But I know you're not waiting for that, but it's just one of those, it's an interesting observation from my perspective to, to we keep hearing about the new softer, gentler version of Tiger, and that may very well be true, and I hope it is. But in this instance, yeah. um, I would have thought a little more personal touch would, would have been in order. Um, by the way, um, you are a PGA professional, so I'm glad you're still in the game. The game needs PGA professionals with your background and with your ethos and your love of the game. I'm just wondering how often if a guest comes to play at the club or if you're out giving a lesson, you have to retell the stories. I mean, is it mm -hmm. is it still frequent or has, has the passage of time lessened the request for the, Hey, tell me about that time. No, I honestly, I, I feel like I tell that story every time I play golf with, with people, every time I'm, I'm out there, um, you know, at a dinner or it, the story comes up an awful lot because people want to be connected to Tiger Woods. I mean, everybody wants to, to have a firsthand story of Tiger Woods. And fortunately I'm able to give them one, but uh, yeah, for me, I, I'm a, I am a PGA professional. I'm a golf professional at the Outpost Club, which is a national golf society. I, I held a traditional, it's kind of a non-traditional golf professional role that I hold now. I travel the country and I run events for the Outpost Club and our Silver Club Golfing Society, which is a competitive offshoot of the Outpost Club. But we set up events at great places and, you know, I don't have that, that home club anymore, you know, to, uh, I don't stock a golf shop and and do all that, but uh, like I used to up in the in the uh, Northeast in New York and New Jersey. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's still a lot of fun. I'm in the broadcasting world as well, and and with PGA Tour Live and getting in with Golf Channel a little bit. And so um, yeah, the the story is is out there a lot, and people really want to be connected to to Tiger Woods and hear that story. And um, you know, I've told a lot of people this in the last few months. You know, as this book is starting to come out, but you know, I've told this story for 25 years without a book, and now I'm going to tell it probably for the next 50 years right. with a book. So um, it's uh, it's just that great reminder yeah. of of what the game's all about. Well, you have a gift for telling the story, and I'm glad you did it. The book is called, Hey, Tiger, You Need to Move Your Mark Back, Nine Simple Words That Change the Game of Golf Forever. It's available everywhere starting June 1, but you can pre-order it right now. And Steve Scott would be happy if you did. So make sure you yep, do. You can, you can yeah. go on my website, uh, movethatback.com or stevescottpga.com. And you'll be able to order my book and uh, pre-order it. And it'll ship on May 18th for those who want to hop on uh, the website early. And it'll be on Amazon and all the uh, the big outlets there on June 1st. Very good. Hey, man, thank you so much. Great to talk with you and to hear the story firsthand. Oh, thank you. 